So maybe a first question would be, give us a state of just your tribe. Madison has just been designated in December, Truax Field, as the home of F-35A. Doctor, can you start? Give us an overview. On December 29, Governor Tony Evers made two announcements. The backlog of unemployment, job, of job, jobless benefits claims, excuse me, had been cleared up, number one. Number two, he was appointing Amy Pahacek, Secretary Designee of the Department of Workforce Development. Then last night, in his State of the State message, the governor said, we need a special legislative session to, up, to update the systems that pay unemployment benefits. And today, he, his special session bill asked for $5.3 million to begin that process. So the timing couldn't be better for a newsmaker's interview with DWD Secretary Designee Amy Pahacek. Secretary, welcome to Wisconsin Eye. Thanks for having me, Steve. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, sorry for that long intro, but there's been a lot of news in your agency, ma'am. <laughs> there really has. Um, I, I yeah. do want to talk about the process to update. But first, the, the second CARES Act from Congress added uh, some additional 300 per week benefits. Now, um, do you have an estimate of how many Wisconsin residents might be eligible and when those additional 300 per week benefits could be starting to be paid, ma'am? Yeah, absolutely. So Steve, you're referring to the federal pandemic unemployment compensation, which you are correct in 2020 under the CARES Act was an additional $600 per week a supplemental payment for anybody who qualified for a different unemployment benefit during that week. And under the Continued Assistance Act, um, there is 11 additional weeks of what we call FPUC. And uh, that, oh, sorry about that. So those, uh, that additional 11 weeks is now $300 and um, still with the same eligibility requirements that if somebody is receiving at least $1 of an underlying unemployment benefit, they'll receive this additional $300 on top of that. So we don't have an exact number of who will qualify as, you know, claimants, uh, circumstances uh, of eligibility, you know, change every day. But based on our best um, ability to estimate, looking backwards, we think approximately 95,000 folks uh, will qualify for that. Um, and we're also happy to say that we are anticipating be able to be able to make those payments starting this week. Starting this week. And those payments, yes. would, those payments would, would, would run for how many weeks? Uh, well, it's 11 additional oh, weeks in 2021. Okay, yep. I was just I was just trying to clarify that. You you were asked to take over the agency on September nineteenth. What what did you find? I mean, the backlog had been plaguing the agency, but what were your initial uh, findings once you were asked to take over D DWD? Yeah, so I came in, Steve, and this isn't the first sort of program that I've come in and been asked to lead that's been having some compliance or crisis issues. I've done this a few times. Um, at Milwaukee County, up at Lincoln Hills when I was with DOC. So I kind of have a formula that I follow. I come in and I do an assessment. And so uh, the best way to do that assessment is to talk to the folks who uh, do this work and have been living through some of the issues that they have been experiencing. So I talked to leadership um, and I also held listening sessions, uh, sort of town halls with all of the unemployment employees. We had over 500 folks attend and I asked them, you know, what's working, what's not working, um, where can we improve, what, you know, they're the experts, what do we need to be doing to really move the needle here? Um, also listen to the public, the uh, Unemployment Insurance Advisory Council held several public hearings. I attended all of them, read every single comment um, of their you know, public statements and things that they emailed in. And um, it was really clear to me at that point that uh, this was a problem that couldn't be solved um, just by people power alone. 
even though I did take some initial steps to really kind of uh, add some resources to the department, um, I mandated over time, we made uh, additional program positions and hired, and we also increased our contractor capacity. Um, but it was still clear to me that we weren't going to be able to get through sort of the monumental backlog of claims um, by the end of the year without really uh, utilizing some technology and some partnerships, kind of thinking outside the box. And I saw one estimate that in September, the backlog was about 100,000. Is that a uh, accurate number? And Talk to me then about your attempts. Well, um, you then engaged Google and what services did Google, uh, how did Google help the agency, ma'am? Sure. So um, there's lots of different ways and metrics to follow unemployment claims. We can talk in terms of weekly claims, people who have filed claims, who we refer to as claimants, you know, benefit amounts. Uh, and it, it's been reported various different ways in the press. So the 100,000 number back in September uh, represents the amount of people who were still waiting for a benefit determination who had filed claims. I think it was slightly above 97,000. So we've been saying about 100,000 folks back in September. Um, and so at that point, uh, you know, I guess let me also clarify when we talk about the backlog, what we mean by the backlog. So uh, the US DOL, the Department of Labor for the federal government is the jurisdictional authority over all states unemployment administration. And they have standards which they like the states to follow when it comes to the administration of benefits. And one of the standards is called the timeliness standard. And for that standard, they want states to be able to make a determination on initial filing of a benefit within 21 days. So outside of that 21 days, when a, when a determination has not been made, that's when we refer to something as being in the backlog, because now we are outside that standard. Um, everything else is sort of just the normal workflow that comes in. So uh, when I got in, we, I really wanted to distinguish between what is technically the backlog, what's just being filed on a daily basis, and really focused on those claims that were 21 days or older with the goal to either have them fully resolved or an active process by the end of the year so that they could all get caught up. And that's uh, that was the milestone we were able to meet by 1231 of 20. And that put us in line with our pre-pandemic timeliness standards where we had been uh, before the pandemic. So we were very happy with that milestone, um, but we're gonna continue to, to move forward and make improvements on that. You know, I really wanna get to 100% of all claims filed uh, you know, with a determination uh, less than 21 days. I mean, we really want to keep gaining. We still have a lot more work to do, but that was our, our first big achievement. And you said that you soon realized you, you couldn't do it with people power. So what, what role did Google put, pay and how much did it cost uh, to, uh, how, mu uh, how much did the agency pay Google for the initial help? Sure, sure. So uh, we have a couple uh, different projects going with Google. The backlog is what we call Google Phase One, and um, you know it, it got to that point where I realized we weren't going to be able to tackle this problem with people power alone. And that's when we started to hear about some of the work Google was doing with other states. They had worked with Arizona, they had worked with New York, and really helping them make progress on their backlogs and their claims. Um, so we entered into a contract with them. It was approximately $1.1 million, of which we are submitting for reimbursement through uh, the CARES Act. Um, so hopefully that will be a, a federally paid expense. And what they did is they used um, advanced analytics to look at those claims in the backlog and really help us come up with uh, eligibility reporting metrics, confidence scores about which claims um, we should be moving forward. And then we got that data back, did our own assessment of it, um, but it just allowed us to be far more strategic in how we moved through those claims. Okay, thank you. Last night in his response to the governor, Speaker Voss used the number, there are 9,000 claims still pending. Are these 9,000 claims within the 21-day within the window, ma'am? 
So I think the number uh, that Speaker Voss was referring to was the number of total claims uh, at the end of the year, which was on 12 31 20. And of that 9,000, uh, the 5,000 were the ones that were outside of that 21 day window. Um, these numbers are fluid. They change every hour based on our processing. Somebody's already filed a claim since you and I began talking and we've already paid or processed additional claims. So I don't have the exact number today, but um, that 9,000 represents claims that were not considered part of a backlog because they were not older than 21 days. Okay, so as of we speak, uh, today, there's no backlog exceeding 20, uh, 21 days? So I, we would have to run the numbers right now to know if another claim has you know, oh, gone over the 21 days. So there certainly could be claims, but there, the difference between where we were uh, back in September is those claims were just sitting in a queue waiting to be worked on. Now they are actively in process uh, with information gathering, contact with claimants. So, you know, we, we're going to continue to move. But that number of when something falls outside of 21 days is a constant moving target. Thank you. The governor in his formal call for a special session, uh, I think on the 19th, said that he is asking initially 5.3 million to begin the process of updating systems, which the governor said in his speech, date back to the days of President Nixon in the 1970s. Talk to me about the antiquated system that you found in place when you, when, when you became head of the agency, please. Sure, so uh, the Cobalt system is approximately 50 years old. It's on a mainframe. Uh, I wish I had a photo I could send you uh, just of what it looks like when our uh, benefit specialists log in. It's a you know, stereotypical screen you'd think you'd see from early 1980. It's a black screen with little green bouncing, you know, uh, like numerical, I and mean, it's unreal. It's, it's unreal how old this system is. Um, and it's not flexible, it's not nimble, it's programming, Cobalt programmers are hard to find. And it's, it's just a system that is far outlived its useful life. Let me give you an example of some of the other challenges we have with this 50 year old system. Uh, right now, Steve, if a claimant needs to get us documentation, um, let's say they need to send us wage verification or you know, some other type of documentation to support their claim, they have two choices. They can either mail that documentation via like the US Postal Service, or they can fax it to us. I mean, who has a fax machine, right? So part of our phase two partnership with Google, which is the second big um, engagement that we have with them, is really getting some of these technological sort of short term to mid term solutions in place just to be more user friendly. Um, that includes like a document uh, portal upload for folks so that they can go online right from their phone or their laptop and just upload documentation that we need. It's also going to have a secure messaging component because right now, if, um, if an adjudicator or a claimant need to connect to have a conversation about, you know, maybe the circumstances of why they left their last employer or, you know, are they able and available to work if there's a question, they have to schedule an interview. So a claimant We'll have to call our call center, set up a time to schedule an interview. If something comes up and that person's no longer available, they have to reschedule. I mean, it's just a delayed, protracted process. So uh, part of our phase two is also getting in secure messaging right through the portal so that claimants and adjudicators can have that instant messaging and really you know, increase that flow of information so that we don't have these long delays going forward. Well, that's my next question. If the 5.3 million is approved as part of the next budget, the 21-23 biennial budget, how will the system be upgraded just in the short term by mid-2023, please? Certainly. So, you know, the, the unemployment modernization is a full scale, you know, full system, brand new system, benefit system, tax system. It's really um, getting us into the current technology. And that is a process. We, you know, DWD did a lot of research, uh, you know, headed into the budget. And when they first came on board in 2019 about how do we get to system modernization and looked at lot, uh, what a lot of other states have done. And it's, you know, a three to five to seven year process um, to really even just get all of those systems up and running. There's the RFP and then there's the customization and just, 
the training. I mean, it's, it's an ordeal. Um, but what we would be able to do is really focus on the benefits system first. So the one that's public facing that would have the most, um, the greatest impact to claimants and, and focus on getting that up and running within the next few years. So it would be a fully modern system. Um, and then, you know, through the remaining years of getting that system up and running, we would work on the tax and the uh, the tax system and the interfaces and any other customization we would need. Does that mean if that money is approved and appropriated uh, in mid twenty in July of 2023, a claimant would not have to either use snail mail or fax? Oh, the snail mail and the fax is actually a short-term solution that I already have in okay. progress through Google. Okay. So that will be hopefully up and running by the end of March of this year. Um, but that's, again, that's just sort of a short to midterm uh, solution for that one issue. Um, a full system modernization gets us to be able to do things like that, plus uh, programming and other uh, just, you know, flexible benefit um, maneuvering so that if there is changes to law, we can implement those immediately. We don't have to have these, you know, several month lead up of trying to do, you know, programming on a mainframe that's 50 years old that just takes a long time and then has to be tested for months because it's uh, an older system. So the, the modernization gets us all of those things and much, much more. The whole timeline of updating, 10 years, $90 million, and is that in 2021 dollars, I assume? So that price tag would probably uh, be, be higher? Um, I think the, the price tag does account for sort of inflation and looking forward. Uh, it wouldn't take 10 years to fully implement. The last several years of that 10 year timeline is sort of the maintenance and the license fees that we would have to pay. Again, you know, in a matter of two to three years, we would be hoping to already have um, some usefulness out of the, the initial benefit side of the system and then continue to add functionality as the years go on. And I don't want to be a downer, but what's the downside if the 5.3 million to begin the mon modernization is not approved? Uh, well, I think the downside, if, if we're not able to, you know, modernize, uh, we are looking at potential catastrophic failure going forward of this system. I mean, the system won't survive forever. And um, the delays that we already have are a result of, you know, the, the technology that we've been, um, you know, kind of stuck with now for 50 years. So uh, it would be great. I'm really excited about the special session. Um, you know, if we could get support to start the process now, we are anxious to hit the ground running so that we can start moving the needle along, you know, for this modernization. Um, so I, I'm, you know, I'm hoping that we can, can already get moving on this. Thank you. Um, I am astonished. Um, on, in February, there were 500 FTEs in the Unemployment Insurance Division. You ended the year with more than 1,800. Now, to, to meet the, I think it was 8 million weekly claims, correct, that just swamped the system? Uh, yes, there were, there were yeah. almost, 9 million, almost um, 9 million, you know, between March and December of 2020. And then in the, the four prior years, Steve, from 2016 to 2019, Right. There were 7.2 million. I mean, so we had over four years of work in nine months. Going from 500 in uh, 500 workers in that division to 1,800. Talk to me about the future. Will you continue to need the 1,800, or will some of the state employees who were drafted to work in the UI division will they be sent back? Will you have to lay off? What's your what's your what's your FTEs needs going forward, please? Sure. So that's going to depend on a lot of things, but you hit on the important part, which is, you know, that 1800 includes um, other agency staff that we uh, borrowed to help get us through our, our high points. It also includes other DWD staff members from other divisions that were reassigned to unemployment. So, um, you know, when the need if the need starts to decrease for the amount of you know people that we have you know our first couple steps are sending employees back to their home departments or home agencies we also have a lot of contracted work 
And um, having those different layers allows us to kind of turn the dial on the workload without having to look at layoffs of permanent employees or anything like that. But insofar as our staffing needs going forward, we continually assess those based on federal programs. Um, you know, there is a potential for more federal programs going forward. We have a new Congress. Uh, we'll have a new president soon. So um, we'll, you know, it just as the, you know, need and services continue, we'll constantly evaluate how many folks that we have. Well, will will uh, will the federal will federal aid pay for any of the upgrade of the U U of I system? There is a potential um, for some federal funding there, so we're continuing to look at all avenues of where we can, you know, tap into additional resources to get that funding. Okay. Now you've heard some of the painful stories of people who waited months to get very real unemployment benefits uh, that they needed to pay bills. Um, does do you as secretary designee uh, do you feel a need to apologize for those that waited so long to to get some of these benefits yeah so i certainly feel that this pandemic and what happened in 2020 i mean unprecedented doesn't even begin to explain you know what happened not only in the unemployment division but across the country you know, the pandemic has impacted our families, our neighbors, our communities in ways that we have just, you know, never could imagine. So, and I, I feel terrible for anybody who has been impacted by this pandemic, either through sickness or loss of income. Um, it's, you know, it's been, it was a tough year. And I certainly understand the frustration that people have, um, you know, based on, on the impacts of this you know, COVID-19. Okay. Um, well, we've talked about modernizing the U of I system. Uh, can you give us a, color, uh, a couple other goals for your agency over the next two years? Yeah, absolutely. So we still have a lot of work to do in unemployment. So we'll continue to move the needle and uh, do everything we can to gain efficiencies there and, you know, continue to serve the, the folks in Wisconsin who need those benefits. Um, so that's obviously a, a top goal, of course, still going forward. Um, but, you know, really, I look at 2021 as hopefully the year of economic recovery and DWD plays a big role in that. You know, so this pandemic has impacted um, certain communities, certain industries, uh, you know, that may not ever fully recover and certainly has underscored other economic disparities uh, throughout our communities. And so we are really focused now on looking at the job market and the economy post pandemic. And we know it's gonna look different than it looked pre pandemic. Um, so, you know, just being able to get additional training to supplement skills, upskilling to those uh, job seekers who might be in one of those industries that's been permanently impacted. And then really being able to connect uh, employers with qualified candidates and um, just you know, continue to support that economic recovery for, for all of Wisconsin. I know from covering the Capitol for quite a while, um, the, 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 the unemployment trust fund has ebbed and flowed. Uh, I uh -huh. remember covering it when it was, well, back in the Doyle administration after the Great Recession, big deficit. Then we ran up a balance pre-pandemic. Uh, can you update us on the U of I trust fund now? Yeah, absolutely. So as of December 31st, 2020, the trust fund had $1.1 billion in it. We have not had to borrow from the federal government uh, okay. since the pandemic. Um, but to give you a little bit of context, Steve, um, there are about 20 states that are already borrowing from the federal government, including some of our neighbors, uh, Illinois, Minnesota, and a few others. But right now we are still um, you know, in the black and have $1.1 billion in the fund. Well, just a couple more questions. I do want to respect your time. Do you think your progress since, since September 19th justifies your confirmation by the by the Senate, which you're well aware of the criticism prior to, prior to you getting there? Do you think you should be confirmed? Well, I, I certainly am very proud of the progress um, that we've made in the last three months. You know, clearing the backlog, the progress we've made with Google Phase 2, with those technological advances that we have, 
There's one other initiative that I just want to talk about really quickly that we're really excited about, uh, which is our plain language initiative. And what this is, is uh, through our partnership with Google and, and clearing the backlog and looking at those analytics, we recognize that certain questions on our unemployment application caused a lot of confusion. And when I went back and really looked at, you know, the questions and how we were asking um, people about their eligibility and their circumstances, the application was, um, was pretty difficult to understand. There was some legalese in it, there's jargon. It's not entirely clear always what we're asking. And that was causing more people to go into adjudication and, and to hold status. So one other huge initiative that we've started is what we're calling the plain language uh, initiative. And we um, hired a, you know, a technical firm to come in and rewrite the entire application to make it simple and easy to understand. And uh, we opened that up for public comment uh, a few weeks ago and really wanted feedback from stakeholders and other folks about, you know, is this easier to understand? What's your feedback? And, and we're also doing focus groups now with people who have gone through the unemployment process and asking them, you know, what other areas of this process were um, confusing or difficult or frustrating. And uh, what we're finding and what we're hoping is that once we get, you know, the plain language, very easy to understand application up, um, you know, people of varying educational backgrounds, regional or cultural differences, uh, we really hope it's going to be much more user friendly and easier, you know, for folks to have access to these benefits and to work through this process. So when's the, I'm excited about that. When's, so, the earliest, um, uh, when's the earliest that this more clear form could confront those that are applying for jobless benefits? Yeah, so uh, we're, it's going to be an iterative process. We're focusing on those questions that are causing people the most confusion first, because each time we update a question, we have to do additional programming. And right now, Steve, obviously, our, our focus is getting those new federal programs like FPUC, which we hope to start paying this week. That's that's our main priority to continue to get those benefits out. But we um, our, our goal is to get uh, to begin to put these simplified questions up and as part of the process by March. Okay, thank you. But, Maybe just but all that's a long answer to say that I'm very proud of what we've gotten done, and that's just in three months. And um, I would hope that uh, if I were, you know, confirmed, um, you know, that the Senate would recognize the progress that we're making, and and that you know, I recognize there's a lot more to do, and I'm excited to do that, and to keep keep you know the needle moving and the ball rolling. Maybe a final question: the um, provisions of the Assembly passed COVID nineteen response bill. Um, that would mandate that uh, DWD come up with a plan to eliminate the backlog. Number one, uh, it would require that uh, U of I offices be open 24 seven to receive and process claims. It would reinstate the one week waiting period. Would these be reasonable changes, Amy? Um, you know, there are some challenges with some of these provisions, keeping offices open, extended call centers. I mean. We've already met the, the backlog requirement. One of the other provisions that I noted was um, the appeals. I don't know if you're aware, Steve, but um, the rate of appeals uh, have significantly increased as well with the claim volume. Uh, just to give you, again, a little bit of context on this, in all of 2019, there were 16,881 appeals. And in 2020, there were over 46,000. So right now, we have 15,500 appeals waiting for a hearing. So that is, uh, that's quite a haul, but we've got a strategy in place. We've already increased the amount of judges that we have. We've uh, increased their caseloads and their hearing uh, hours of hearing. We've um, added supplemental support to that team, and we're going to continue to try and work through those. Um, but that those provisions, um, you know, certainly we will uh, we will do whatever we can to meet uh, whatever is passed. Amy Pahacek, Secretary Designee of the State Department of Workforce Development. Congratulations on your appointment, and boy, have you been busy since September yeah. 9th, 19th. But most of all, thank you for a very informative Newsmakers interview. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Steve. My pleasure. Have a great day. Take care. Stay safe. Thank you. This program is a production of Wisconsin Eye, an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit media network with a mission to inform, educate, and engage the citizens of Wisconsin. Wisconsin Eye is the nation's first and only independently funded state civics broadcast network, providing gavel-to-gavel access to government proceedings and events at the state capitol. 